Last week I began by quoting from James Joyce's book Ulysses, the last five lines, about Molly Bloom in bed on June 16, 1904. And today I'm going to continue with that date, 1904. Uh, we're going to focus on Molly and her husband Leopold. And I'll talk about people in 1904. Why? Because these people are reasoners. We're talking about reason and religious belief. What reason are we talking about? We're not talking about reason according to Immanuel Kant, or David Hume, or even Plato. We're talking about the reasoners that we are. If you read the epilogue of Wealth of Self, it begins with a quotation from Hermann Hesse talking about the great flow of humanity. Uh, reasoning is what the group does. What's the size of the group? Well, that's a large question. Enrico Fermi was asked in 1943 about the possibility of extraterrestrial intelligence. And he said, well, where are they? Where is everybody? Now, my focus is on James Joyce's little phrase, here comes everybody. Uh, whether the intelligence is extraterrestrial or not, I, I, I have a claim that it is of this kind. It has these elements. Uh, so that I'm claiming that the elements we discuss are invariant over the history of mankind and elsewhere. Now, if you want fictional versions of that, you go to that famous pro program, Star Trek, which is anticipated by Flash Gordon and Doctor Who. Uh, the people that are met are questioners, even data, Mr. Spock. That's not important for us. For What's important for us is that we discover ourselves. In the end of Wealth of Self, chapter 10, I remark that you are taller than Manhattan, wider than the Red Square, and deeper than galactic space. And it is more than a sorry personal loss not to investigate that. OK, let's carry on with the problem that we began working on last day, finding the way that am me. Uh, I, that's the first section of tonight's session. Finding the way that am me. The second section will be deal with the economy of belief. And the third section will deal with complexities. Now, as I remarked last week, uh, I seem to be reducing the number of topics, but in fact, there are subtopics. So I might as well jot these down. I want to talk about orientations. The orientations within each of us. I want to talk about the orientations as they relate to others. And I want to talk about what we are doing. OK, the economy of belief, there will be basics, and there will be process. And that's the centerpiece of tonight's work. Then the complexities, one, two, and three, there are immediately personal complexities. There are socio-historical complexities. And there are foundational complexities. 
It is worth noting these down because you'll find that things I missed out on last week I build into this week. So for instance, we never got very far with the topic all my I, which is an Irishism which I found out nobody here uh, understood. It's all my I. Uh, so that really gets us back to the topic of Wealth Chapter 5. And yes, there's a fourth section. All right, very briefly, I'll mark it down by page. It's on process page 47. And we'll find that this brings us back to the topic of orientations. Now, uh, the, 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 the problem is to keep going round the same topic. If you begin to think you're getting the hang of it, you're already lost. Isn't that a cheerful notion? In other words, this is superficial and introductory and a peak at a peak. And insofar as you're still somewhat human, you're ready to follow it up. I'll get back to that topic when we get to the question of personal complexities. Finding the way that am me, if you remember last week, I talked about Emma. This is, is quite handy. Uh, in that it, it's a bit joicy and it reminds you of a, a lot of different things at once. In Hebrew, this is the way you would write Emma, backwards. And I, I pointed out that in Hebrew it, it means uh, with <coughs> what? Ma, M-A-H. Uh, I, I was wondering, did Jane Austen know Hebrew? Why did she pick Emma? Probably some very simple reason. Emma Bovary. Searchers. And me as searcher. Maybe. That has been, been a, a, a focal uh, addendum right through. Maybe. And maybe not. Okay. Now, I, I, I mentioned 1904 and reasoners, so as to give us a concrete context, this, this is not a theory of reasoning. It's a reflection on our struggle as human beings. Uh, 1904, uh, Helen Keller got her degree in Radcliffe, utterly disappointed by the hasty education. She pointed out in her autobiography, she said, it seems that one goes to college not to think, but to learn. Uh, you get a quite different view from Albert Schweitzer, the, the famous German who became a missioner. He talks about the no enormous advantage of his German schooling that they didn't interfere with him. He was able to get on with his studies. How grateful I am that the German university does not, this is last century, does not supervise the student too closely in his studies. Now keep him breathless through constant examinations. Mm. Albert Schweitzer in 1904, uh, he had already a doctorate in theology. He had worked, written, a, he was writing a marvelous book on Bach. And in 1904, he picked up, June 1904, uh, there was a magazine published pointing out the needs of Africa. And it gave him a complete reorientation. I was thinking of Einstein in 1904. He managed to get a job as a patent officer. And in that year, he wrote three famous papers that were published in volume several, seven, 17 of a journal of physics in 1905, and they opened up physics, an orientation of this particular man. I, I'm mentioning people that I think are significant for giving us some intimation of orientations. 
Now, you may find other people. Uh, you may be into dance then. Twilight Harp, Merce Cunningham. Twilight has now come back to New York after a spell with classical ballet. Uh, you may be into music, whatever, but is there somebody that helps you notice this largeness of yourself? A stray poet, Phil Collins, whatever. Okay, so we're, it's a concrete reflection on our orientation. What is the orientation that is us? Well, let's get back to our elements. Are we in our elements? Okay. Now, I, I'm sure at this stage that, yeah, could you name some of these elements? Good. <laughs> So, th we have the elements in us of sense. Let's just say sense. And let's put it down as not sensibility, but sensibility, just to give it an extra twist. Now, that's an enormously complex part of us. Because I, I, I write down a simple word, a sensibility is our physics chemistry, botany, zoology, and it inherits the history of the emergence of the Earth, the lunar cycles, and so on. And it is the orientation in us, ability, that grounds the search for beauty. That's the first level we talked about, lying on the beach. You're feeling the sun, hearing the sea. Now, now this is empirical. You have to check this out all the time. This is not some Lonergan view of the human being. A few people have asked me, I, I find I have a very strange spread of audience. Some people are very lucky they're only doing one credit then they can plunge forward. They will be interested in this complexity. Some people are doing five credits, well, do what you can. Uh, you can follow up this insofar as you have the energy. But as I say, you, your problem is, do I stop this in April? Was I ever interested? I got the credit, well, let's try something else. Uh, so, I, I keep bringing it back to us here. It's not a theory. Uh, yes, I mentioned, say, uh, some people writing to me, asking me, wh why is there so much of, say, Joyce and Lonergan in this book? Uh, I, I recall now Mark Twain talking about Helen Keller. Mark Twain said that the, the two most significant people in the 19th century were Helen Keller and Napoleon. Now, I'm not sure whether he had tongue-in-cheek at that stage. There are other people like Blake and Bruckner that I might pull in there. I think that Joyce and Lonergan are two, the two significant people of the 20th century. But you find your own significant people. Why is Lonergan significant? And this is a very important point to notice. He's not. That's why he's significant. Isn't that a bit of a paradox? It's a bit like my definition of an, of an Irishman in the first week. An Irishman is one who somewhere else is where he was. Why is Lonergan significant? Because he's not. Uh, this is not studying Lonergan. He's not significant because he merely invites you to discover you. If you meet somebody who says, I I'm an expert in Lonergan, you can be suspicious immediately. Or else you can say immediately, you mean you really understand yourself very well? Now, why is Joyce significant? Merely because this guy had an orientation to get his act together. He wanted to bring his life together. Uh, and it came out in literature. And his life was in history. He brought all the myths and fables and languages together gradually, and I don't know whether I can catch 
these with the camera. There's a, a drawing here and a, a vortex done by Brancusi. Brancusi I mentioned in the book in chapter three. You can see this, uh, I only found this recently, but it's what I was talking about at the very first lecture. Uh, you go round and round. There's another cartoon of Joyce, which uh, is delightful, and he influences himself. And there he is. Yeah? This is a quest. I don't know if you can see this. So uh, for me, this is a, a significant person who has an orientation uh, ever going forward. Another person of 1904, Edmund Husserl. He was 45 on October the 15th, and he wrote to his friend Brentano at 45. And he said, I am a miserable beginner, and I long to be in the heights. This is one of the great thinkers of the century. Uh, I mention these because there's a problem in education that was specified by Whitehead earlier in the century, where he said that there is no ethics of achievement left in our education. We're just educated to fit in. We're not outfitted. A real education is out outfits you. Uh, do you know that phrase? I, 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 I went to the tailor and got outfitted. Yeah? Now, you, you go to the university to be infitted. OK? So, so the odd thing is these, these people were outfitted. And they didn't fit in. OK, so orientations. Uh, I watched today one of my favorite videos. It's of Cezanne looking at the mountain, St. Victor, Mount St. Victor. An enormous oriented sensibility. Uh, and around 1904, he remarked, and he had only two years left to live. He was 65. I, I, I'm only at the beginning. Why did it take me so long to see? Oh, and you can ask yourself, why is there no room for these people in the modern university? OK, so sensibility is an orientation that we share as a human group. And the achievement of the past invites us towards refinements of sensibility. The music of Bruckner and Mozart, the paintings of Picasso, the ballet of, say, Twilight Tarp. We are capable of enormous things. William Blake used to lament the fact that people looked at the sun and didn't see a hallelujah chorus. They only saw a golden disc. So there is that orientation in us of sensibility. There's the what orientation. You recall from last week, I, I emphasized that statement question, uh, what is it to be human? And I, I indicated, you might say it as a question, but I would say, yes. <laughs> yeah, what? That's being human. What? Ma, in Hebrew. And the child embodies that. The child is a ma. Not like the sheep. It's just amazing. So the what in us is an orientation towards understanding. What is understanding? That's what we're, we're trying to get round to notice. It's what happens when you have that leap. You catch on, you put two and two together, you solve these puzzles, you find out the 50 ways in which those five words can be handled, or you figure out that number. Yeah, how many of you figured out why that number is important for English speakers? You did, yeah? Should I tell you? Well, maybe, maybe later. Uh, the orientation of, of whating towards understanding. And there's an orientation in us 
of ising. And somehow that survives more than the whatting instinct. We can easily give up an understanding, but we're a little slower, not totally, a little slower giving up on truth. We'll see later that when I say not totally, I mean we can be very gullible. That's the problem of critically believing. But ising is there. How many of you like to be fooled? Oh, I'm so happy I was made a complete idiot of today. <laughs> no, he's lying. She's lying. Yeah. As they say in Ireland, true her teat. <laughs> okay. Is. You want the truth. And it's spontaneous. It's not because scripture says the truth will make you free. It's because it's native to you. I'm the sort of thing that is, and when I is properly, <laughs> I says yes. And we're back to this question of nodding. I'll talk about three types of nodding when we get to the economy of belief. Okay, so that's an orientation towards truth. Now you can recall the, the, the elements within each level. There are three elements on each level. Your what question leads to insight. Your insight leads to serious concept. And I remarked that you should watch the way the word concept is used in North America. It regularly means name. By concept, I mean something that makes you capable of talking for 10 hours steady coherently, and something you may spend years getting. And you can say, golly, I have no concepts. Just don't put it down on your other exams. Okay, and an orientation towards truth. And then you have an orientation, what to do. Again, you can think of our illustration, the cooking illustration. You have people coming to dinner. What am I going to do? And if you're alive, you, you follow your orientation. That orientation in you is an orientation to venture. And that may help to think about it. Advent, the coming, the future, venture. Never venture, never win. Adventure. I talked to my colleague Bob Henman about this yesterday, and he said, well, of course, children illustrate this enormously well. The, the adventure, the fantasy, the, the possibilities, the, everything can be an adventure. It's, it's a bright-eyed orientation towards the future, a state of surprise. It has a lot to do with eternal life, which I characterize at the very end of the epilogue of Wealth of Self as a state of infinite surprise. Wow! So there's an orientation towards adventure. Possibilities, not stale possibilities. What are we going to have for dinner? Oh, the same old thing. Am I to do? That's the question of what? Is it worth doing? What's that orientation towards? Worth somehow. Is it worthwhile? Am I going to cook dinner for my friends? Am I going to go to the university? Always somehow is a reach for something worthwhile. So let's call the orientation towards, these are just suggestive, descriptive words, inti, mate, what would really be worthwhile? A mate, as, as they say in Australia and so on. Uh, or, or another phrase that might help you, sort of in Canadian English, you're looking for a real worthy
but it's an orientation in us. And it's these orientations that connect up, as we will see next week, with faith, with an ultimate nodding, crystallized in the phrase, yes, my Redeemer liveth. There is a real worthy, even if I'm in the dark. Okay, so I, I'm just hinting at what each of us is and what each of us is not allowed to be. We have no time to stand and stare, one poet says. Another poet says, nor does foot feel being shod. And you have Helen Keller's regrets about what colleges do. I was thinking today of that quaint scholar of myth and of Joyce, Joseph Campbell. He, he, he remarked that a doctorate is murder, it kills your mind. <laughs> he didn't do any higher studies like that. But he went on eventually to teach at a small women's college in uh, the States. And one of the jokes they had was about the famous college Vassar. Uh, and he said the joke was that you could bring a girl to Vassar, but you can't make her think. <laughs> and there's a sad fact that this orientation that's alive and well in the neonate, and many of you have watched a, a month old baby in the presence of colors and sound and mobiles, yeah? And cuddles and tumbles, yeah? the kinesthetic sensibility that eventually can be reached by the great dancers. But in us it's dead, we can just barely get around. Uh, okay, so, so our problem is to, to, to somehow pause and find, is this really me? Is there anything of me left? <laughs> Finding the way that I'm me, but the problem is, what I'm looking towards now is the normative. There are lots of names for this, the, the openness in, in the first of Einstein's famous, or second of Einstein's famous papers, he uses the word heuristic, which is eureka, a reach out. Ah! Uh, am I on the edge of surprise all day, every day? Well, no, hell, you gotta be real. You gotta be dull. Okay, the normative way that I am, it, it's not a, a, a normative in the sense of ethics that you find in the churches or in the legal systems. It's an inner ethics. Real ethics is the, is the subject that I am reaching out to be as I need to be. We'll get back to that a little later. Does that make some sense? We're still talking about these 13 elements, and I'm just touching on properties. We're not going anywhere scientifically. If I was discussing sodium with you, I could bring out bottles of sodium. It's a dangerous thing to handle and show you how it burns and if you let it loose and so on. Magnesium, spark it off. Bring in a bottle of hydrogen, boom! Uh, just to notice that, yeah, there, there's, there's still something lurking in me that makes me human and therefore lonely. The epilogue to Wealth of Self brings this point out. The title is Being and Loneliness. And at this stage, I'm inclined to give you a vague description of reason. You recall my very first class, what is reason? It's going from premises to conclusions. Well, the hell it is. What is reason? It's the dim light of our embodied loneliness. The dim light of our embodied loneliness. And the difficulty, as we'll see when we move down to socio-historical considerations is that everything seems to conspire to put that light out, including rationalism. Rationalism is just a well-developed nominalism. 
the reason in us that is in our bones is, is that liveliness of spirit that wonders and that reaches satisfaction only slowly at a pace that does not seem to be welcome in the 20th century. Okay, so that's just another way of looking at these 13 elements, of noticing them, and perhaps of withdrawing, saying to yourself, well, gosh, I'm just gasping to finish the year's work so that I can really get down to find me, the way that I am, the way that am me. Now, it helps to think of the, those orientations in terms of others. We've already talked a little bit about that, and you'll find that terrible page, wealth page 17, others, parents. I was recalling this morning when I was going over this, a colleague of mine in Boston began the lecture by the statement, and I can't give you the full statement, but you'll get my meaning. He starts his lecture by saying, parents, us up. Uh, and it is a problem in our contemporary society. The mother in this, yeah, the child really wants to understand a uh, wallaby. The name isn't good enough. No, what, what, what do you mean? Shut up. And it's a horror in society that a person can sit down and choose between the liveliness of a two-year-old and the deadliness of the crippled chronicle. Yeah? And one parent says, shut up, your mother's reading the paper. Huh? Keeping in touch. Okay. <laughs> now, the others, let's get back to Molly Bloom and Poldy. And this is to help us notice that these, two, these 13 elements are vibing along, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, etc. Okay, so you have, I'm taking Molly and Poldy, or Jack and Jill, or whatever. Face to face, that problem we will get back to here, just in what way are they face to face? But you have sensibility. Let's put down some of these is, what, what to do, and am I? And I suppose for consistency I should go around behind the board and write it the other way, like, you know, etc. Okay, so you've got the, the what, it is what to do, what, and sense. And they, they, are, they are oriented towards one another, okay? And they have all the dynamisms I talked about. And you'll find that if you read through the book Ulysses and follow up and read the book Finnegan's Wake. Or you'll find it in good literature. Don Quixote. Yeah, there's a Don Quixote in us all gasping for adventure. And the problem in our contemporary scene is that the adventure is elsewhere. I regularly recall Saul Bellow's novel, Mr. Samner's Planet. And Mr. Samner is going down through Manhattan and he sees from his taxi a row, a fight on the other side of the street. And he notices it's a cousin of his and he gets out of the taxi to go over and do something about it. And then he notices the crowd gathered round the fight and he realizes, oh heavens, the beatitude of our time. The ones in, in Matthew, are, 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 they're not relevant. No, blessed are the present. Yeah? We're watching our Canadian in orbit. Yeah? 
We're listening to the news. What about the orientation that is the subject? So there's a spectator sport in the 20th century. We watch our government running things badly, or whatever. All gathered round to hear Bush give the State of the Union speech. Well, at least, you know, in, in, in America, they, they, they seem to be better off in the States than in Canada. Not much, though. You know that in, in America, you, they have Johnny Cash and Bob Hope and Stevie Wonder. And in Canada, we've no cash and no hope and no wonder. <laughs> All right. So Molly has these orientations, and so has Poldy. Uh, do they invite each other to stay alive? And the problem in the, is in the contemporary scene, this, this doesn't work. Now, we will talk about that more when we talk about the complexities. But at this stage, I just want you to notice that a conversation between two human beings in the behaviorist model, you have what I call billiard ball sociology. You've got stimulus response, interchange, and these are undefined. I'm trying to indicate that the talk between one talk and another talk, there occurs this. And like I mentioned at the end of last day, I want you not to believe that. Yeah? This is weird. When, when Poldy says, will you marry me? And she says, yes. Well, it's just a reflex. Will we go, will we go dancing? Yes. No. I'm claiming that if you're asked to go dancing, eating, whatever, this happens. The, the, the reaction, the return of speech. I talked last week about the return of serve. Nebratilova or Jimmy Connors. And I want you to think of it as quite incredible. Yeah? You've got Martina on the baseline and uh, Sabatini serving. Does, does she really do all this? Yeah? Come on. It's, it's crazy, isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah? She doesn't do all that. You know, I see the ball. What is it? It's a ball. What will I do? <laughs> so this self-discovery is difficult work. And this is so spontaneous and so swift that it is not part of the literature. I got a dictionary of philosophy yesterday, and I looked up the word Q. What, what would it be in this dictionary under Q? Well, surely there's a big section on questions. No, there are two entries under Q. One is quantity, and the other is quine. It was a logician. So I'm inviting you to discover something that displaces you. It outfits you. Do you want to be outfitted for life? Yeah? You can, you can leave that. I, I have ad drop forms. <laughs> OK, so the conversation between these two involves that movement, I, I tried to bring that out by talking in Gaelic. If I say on will and solace are lasa, I get no reaction. And if I talk for 10 minutes like that, you say he's really flipped. I'm just saying, is the light on? Now, how do you know that the light's on here? And it's hot. Huh? Could be honest, yes? Yeah? He just looked, doesn't it? Yeah. Come on, are you nodding? <laughs> no, you. <laughs> yes, too. Yeah, shaking your head. Yeah, you know the lights on. You just look, isn't that it? I feel. And you feel it. Yeah, you see it, see it, sense it, feel. That's all. Yeah. So this is all Barnard material. 
I'm claiming that you know the light is on when you get this far. And you say, yes. Yeah? So, so I'm trying to get you not to just write this down, OK? If I remember this, I'll get the midterm. I disagree. I don't think it's an normative way that we are. Oh, no, it's, it's that it's, word up there. Yeah, it, 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 it's normative, but it's not the way we are. Normal, it, it, it's the no, normal way is death, OK? But the normative way is the way of aspiration. But I, I'm just trying to bring out the very simple point that your spontaneous answer to the question, how do you know the light is on, is you just look. Yeah? Isn't that true? It's, yeah, be honest, yeah. What's the guy fussing about? I just look. And I'm saying, no, that's not true. That, in fact, it involves puzzling and saying yes. And you do it so spontaneously that it is not considered. They're, these are elusive elements. Light travels at about a million miles every five seconds. This is a lot more rapid. I'm not talking about the neural operation now, but the operation of spirit. But, but I really want you to, this is the, the basic content of our first few weeks, <coughs> to, to notice these in yourself, that you do sometimes say what and is, and what am I going to do? But and I'm talking for you that I, I don't do it all the time. My normal conversations are just stimulus response. And there, of course, there are conversations like that, you know. You're sitting with the most boring person. I, I recall occasions when I, I've sat with boring, I, I, a friend, well, no, an acquaintance in Oxford, and he was so boring that he talked on the in-breath. You couldn't get a word in edgeways. And he told huh? <laughs> yeah. So there's a sense in which, and, and you've all done this, I'm, I'm sure, you, you get into a stage where you're, you're just sort of nodding regularly and hoping it's the right motion. Ah, yeah. <laughs> okay, that, that gets nearer the reflex. But in the normal conversation, uh, there's a level of alertness, and you expect it. And insofar as you're really alert, you notice when it's not there. And many of you have, in the middle of a conversation, noticed the shift in the eye focus of the person you're talking to. And they're not there at all. Yeah? So in a conversation that is genuine, these are operative. And the talk is, it, is it an interchange of sensibility, and it moves in the context of body language. Uh, a wink is as good as a nod. If the room is bugged, you can be saying one thing and doing the opposite. Yeah. You can't be up to these Americans. <laughs> so the talk is on that level, but the real conversation is the movement upwards. And the real relating is the wonder that constitutes each person as wonderful. OK, now what are we trying to do here? That's my next question. And it's very important to focus on this question, because a central part of any course in philosophy is to find out what is philosophy. OK? And it has occurred to some of my TV friends, yeah. What are we doing in this course? I thought we'd be doing something else. Uh, we're doing what was recommended by Socrates. Finding the way that we are. OK, it's a Germanic Anglo-Saxon word, but if you go back to the, the roots, you'll find hados, method, Indo-European, and I like, I like to, think, to think of a hard, the hard man. Somebody asked me what song I was going to sing on the program. I said Finnegan's Wake, because Tim Finnegan was a hard man. How many of you know what a hard is? It's, it's a, a sort of a trough for carrying bricks and mortar up when you're building. You don't know these things. And, huh? 
I do speak a foreign language, don't I? Okay, well, a hard man. So it's method. It's finding the way that I am. What are we doing? We're focusing on what we are, and we are what. And, and this is very hard to get at, and we're back in the preface. The question of detecting, detecting. I mentioned in the very first lecture that the key problem of the course is that we may not be doing very much detecting. How can you detect detecting if you're not doing any? Yeah? It's like studying zoology without any animals. And that's why we do these little puzzles. Well, at least I do a little puzzle and I tell the odd clean joke. Because then I know that insights are occurring. And then you can reflect on what that detecting was. So uh, our problem is detecting what happens when we do these things. Okay? Finding the way, the method, the procedure, procedural analysis, where you're, it's yourself is the interest. Does that make some sense? Yeah? What do I do when I live? And philosophy, in that sense, spreads out to discuss what do I do when I reach towards beauty, philosophy of art? What do I do when I reach towards understanding, a philosophy of science, philosophy of truth, and so on? So what is philosophy? It's the effort to discover oneself, the nature of one's living at its basis. And I mentioned that this is invariant. Here comes everybody. Even Mr. Spach works like this. Can't help it. He can keep up a pretense that he's logical. Okay. Now let me push it a little bit further to make it more homely. Let's suppose that Molly is interested in Poldy or Jack and Jill, whatever sort of names you want. Okay, so there's an interest. Wouldn't you expect that, yeah? Well, I don't know the way things go, yeah? They're just shacked up together. Convenient for tax. Or suppose that Molly's interested in, in Poldy. Uh, wouldn't you like it to be a creative interest, yeah? Not just, you know, oh, I keep a catalog of his go goings and comings. I won't pun on that one. Okay. Then you would like Molly to have a creative interest. Yeah? Isn't this, wouldn't you like your mate to have a creative interest in you? Yeah, wouldn't you? Well, thank God I'm married to me, so dull. <laughs> Okay, now what's the creative in interest in? Well, wouldn't you like Poldy to have a creative interest in, in Molly, yeah? Yeah, you would, wouldn't you, yeah? Yes. So, so Poldy would be a creative interest too. Okay. Now, if Molly is a creative interest in Poldy, Molly is a creative interest in creative interest. It, 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 doesn't that follow, should I say logically? Yeah? Molly's a creative interest in creative interest. And there you have another definition of Socratic philosophy, Socratic wisdom. It's a creative interest in creative interest. But the odd twist is that the only creative interest you can investigate is the one within. Now that's a tricky point. Before we push it a bit, entertain some questions. Think not of Poldy and Molly, but, oh, let's say, Back to Emma, Emma the school teacher. 
some of the great characters in the English tradition of novels are, are teachers. The Bronte sisters uh, bring out this. OK, Emma as teacher, what is little Joey, boy or girl? Yeah. Little Joey is, is a creative interest. I, isn't that true? Yeah? I hope. Are, are these smiles of agreement or grins of despair? <laughs> okay, Little Joey is alive and well. One of my students, a religious uh, Sunday school teacher, has found that she's waking up the, the kids in Sunday school by giving them these puzzles. Some of them who regularly don't come at all. One fellow said, oh, I'll have to go next week to get the answer to this puzzle. What's happening is she's waking up the desire which is religious to make connections. Yeah? You can kill off children with religious instruction. OK, but, but my point here is, uh, if Emma wants to deal with joy, then Emma should understand what joy is. And joy is a creative interest. Emma needs a creative interest in creative interest. But my, my key point is that Emma cannot intuit, see Joey's creative interest. How is Emma to discover creative interest? By this turn to herself, what is it in me that constitutes creative interest? It's a self-discovery. You can stare and stare and stare at these little wondrous faces. But you're not getting anywhere. You've got to discover what it is to be creative. Does that make some sense? Yeah. Any 64 cent questions? OK, so that's a little bit on what we are doing. We are doing philosophy. What are we doing? We're trying to be creatively interested in what we are, which is this orientation. Now, the orientation towards truth, that's a fundamental orientation that we have. And the odd thing about this dim light of reason that I talked about is that we cannot get the truth we need on our own. We need others. And that brings us to the next question, the economy of belief. And we're going to spend a lot of the next hour on that. What is belief? Let's make a start. You have knowledge. And I will give you some helpful, what I call props or propositions. What are we finding out that knowledge is? Well, what am I trying to get you to find out? I'm trying to get you to find out that knowledge, which gets you at truth, is correctly understanding experience, which gets at truth. It's going up through these three and nodding. Yes, yes, the light is on. Now, sometimes we, we can't get at the truth. Yes, the bridge is safe. No, you can't. You, you, you can't find out whether the bridge is safe to Dartmouth. You, you're, you're taking it from somebody else. There's an activity of reasoning that I call belief. I'm using it in a precise sense. Belief is when you get at the truth through depending on someone else's knowledge. OK, now that's a very simple introductory description. Knowledge, when you do it on your own, the light is on. Belief, when you rely on someone else's knowledge. OK? And we're going to have to work at that. 
very existentially, a bit like Molly and Poldy. There you are, you, you need the truth. For instance, the truth of where Flamingo is. Where is Flamingo? You don't know, perhaps. You're in the mountain, you want to get to Flamingo or to Sycamore. Even if you get a map, you still don't know. There, there is a way in which you proceed that leads you to the truth. Now, that's going to take us a certain amount of teasing out. It is in wealth self, and we'll work through it in, in an illustration in the next half. Okay?